All right, so now let's look at some cases talking about the parks classification and how to approach these perennial fistulas using that. So on this case, we have starting with our fat saturated T2 series, as I always do, we see that there's some inflammation in this region surrounding the anus. And when we look at our non-fat saturated T2 weighted series, we can see a little bit of brightness here, which isn't fat in that interesting sphincteric plane, but clearly it's inflammation because we knew that from the fat saturated series. We can also see a bit of edema in that internal sphincter musculature. And importantly, we can see the external sphincter coursing anterior to that area of inflammation. So we need to follow that down and we follow that down and we follow it down. And we see that that external anal sphincter remains intact throughout that region. And so because this fistula never courses through that external sphincter, we believe that this is an intersphincteric fistula tract. Oftentimes you aren't gonna see perfectly the, the internal sphincter opening, but sometimes you can. And in this case, I think we can suggest that the internal sphincter opening is right here at the kind of anterior position. Some people like to use the clock face in describing that the location of that potential internal opening to help their surgeons. Our surgeons, at least one or two of them don't like the clock face because it confuses them. So they prefer just verbal descriptors. So for our case, we would read it as an anterior right sided internal opening and then an intersphincteric fistulous tract tracking in that location inferiorly um, and exiting the skin right here near the anus itself. Again, the last thing I like to use is the post-contrast imaging. And this confirms what we've already seen on those other series. And in, in the post-contrast imaging, additionally, what we can see is the fistulous tract, but also we can see an area of kind of inflammation and spread in that interesting pteric plane. And oftentimes we do see that that inflammation can spread a good deal within that interesting pteric plane. And a lot of people call that um, intrasphincteric inflammation or intrasphincteric horseshoeing. And when we see that explaining the extent to which that intrasphincteric inflammation exists is helpful just to give the surgeon an idea of how inflamed and severe the fistula is because that may change whether they do a staged approach to their surgery or how they, how they go about doing things. Lastly, we notice that there is an area of non-enhancement within this fistulous tract and this area of inflammation. And I like to kind of measure how big that area of non-enhancement is um, because all fistulous tracts may have a tiny bit of area of non-enhancement, but if it gets to be over four millimeters, I think that's a good cutoff to say that there's an actual abscess here. And I think in this case, measuring about five millimeters, there is a small intrasphincteric abscess associated with this um, intrasphincteric fistula.